Well, this is going to probably be the least formal video I've ever put out on YouTube. This is going to be a hangout session, okay? I want to talk a little bit. It's late at night. Late at night, I, I think differently. I will say that. You know, a lot of times during the day, kind of get stuck in a rut, think the same way, do things the same way. And I thought, man, you know, I just want to, like, talk, like, as if somebody was sitting next to me. And open up people's minds a little bit because I think a lot of times people think like you know uh, getting rich in the stock market like building up a big portfolio let's say six figures seven figures eight figures I think a lot of people think that's like impossible or unfathomable things like that and I want to just go through a lot of different things in this video I, I don't even want to explain it like I said this is not a very formal video I'm just recording this on the fly uh, randomly on a late Wednesday night in the middle of September or whenever today what is today September 8th so it's gonna be September 9th probably by the end of the video but anyway so look at this I just want to show you uh, to start out here let's go ahead and look at a chart of Amazon over the past whatever years right so think about this for a moment right I mean you go back in time was it that crazy to imagine Amazon was gonna get and, and become a lot bigger and bigger and bigger company over the coming years. I don't think it ever was, right? Um, you know, you, you even go back to 2010, 2011, 2012. I don't think it was out of the imagination that Amazon was going to continue to grow. Like, you know, if you thought Amazon was going to stop growing in 2011 or 2012, you must be crazy, right? Um, you know, if you were investing in Amazon in the 90s, very, very different story, right? In a very, very different time period to be investing in the stock. Even even back in 2002, 2003, 2004, I think back in those time periods, which my gosh, look at that, 2005 here, Amazon's $49 a share. You know, it's 3525 today. You know, back then, I will say, you know, you were taking a bigger risk, right? In 2005, investing in Amazon, they had a lot to prove. They were a growing company. They were growing larger. But I don't think it was like a sure thing at that time, right? I mean, by the time 2011, 2012 rolls around, it's a sure thing. Stock's 170 bucks in 2011, right? And, I mean, imagine you had invested in Amazon, right? You're up, what is that, you know, 20x your money, something like that, right? I mean, in a matter of 10 years, you know, that's that's quite an ROI, let's put it that way. And, and, and the best part about this is it's not like some crazy concept. It's not like some crazy stock, right? It's not like some you know, out of this, you know, NFT or some sort of, you know, crypto or something like that, where it was like, well, this was some crazy risk, right? No, it wasn't. Like, Amazon 2011, it was pretty obvious Amazon was going to become a beast. Amazon 2012, it's $218 a share. Was it out of the imagination that Amazon was going to grow to be a much bigger giant? No, it wasn't. Like, you know, I don't think anybody was ever questioning that, right? And so, you know, you you look at a stock like that. Let's look at Nvidia here, right? Um, Nvidia is a, a good example of a stock that has just been, you know, an absolute beast over the past number of years, right? Now, there were time periods when you're investing in Amazon where it was much bigger risk, right? But it was pretty clear to a lot of folks that looked into the stock, and I had friends that did in, in in 2014 through 2016 that the the business was about to have a huge uptick for many various reasons. And the business began to start doing that, essentially. 2014, you can get this stock for, you know, well, now on a split-adjusted basis, it's like 3 or $4, right? On a split-adjusted basis. Obviously, nowadays, it's 223 but for a lot of, I didn't really understand NVIDIA on, on a high level. Um, I had a friend who did, uh, and I think the, the gentleman made a whole lot of money on NVIDIA, needless to say. Um, and he understood, like, they were doing this, they were doing that. My head back then just couldn't wrap, wrap around it, unfortunately. And, um, you know, uh, folks prospered in that and made an absolute fortune in that stock. And, um, you know, you look at what happened, and then obviously there was a drop. I, I believe this was, you know, partially because of crypto, partially because the, the market was getting weak at that period of time. And then, you know, obviously it upticked again in a huge way. But for folks that really understood this company, it, it wasn't rocket science. Like they were about to have a huge run in this business for years and years ago in future, and it's not stopping today, right? In terms of, um, you know, everything they were going after and everything they were trying to do, right? Um, and, you know, the, Let's go back here for a moment here. You know, a stock that I talked about many, many years ago on the YouTube channel, I made a video about it, AMD. I didn't really understand that one very well either. And um, 
this was a stock that ultimately folks made an absolute fortune in. Um, you know, I mean, look at this. Back in 2015, it's $1.96. And a lot of folks saw what Lisa Sue was putting together and looked at this stock in 2015, 2016, even into 2017. And they saw a company that was building into a bigger and bigger giant, right? And those folks have prospered. I mean, you know, you didn't have to buy the stock at a dollar to make a lot of money, right? Of course, people that bought it for a dollar something have made like 100x on the stock, right? But even the folks that after it was pretty clear they were turning for the better, you know, for folks that really understood this industry rep better, which there was a lot of them, you know, 10, 10 bucks, a lot of folks were buying these shares that they've made a 10x on their money in a matter of four years or so, right? And once again, this is not a stock that it's it's impossible to imagine, um, you know, how big of a beast it was going to become if you really understood this uh, industry well, right? And you, you're going to find with a lot of these stocks, you don't have to understand every industry. You don't have to understand every stock. But when you do understand them very well and you can put these things together and these growth trajectories on what you believe is going to happen, right? Um, you know, it, it's pretty magical. I think we all know this next one coming up here, Tesla. This is my biggest winner I've ever been in personally um, in regards to a stock. And, you know, there was a lot of time periods in Tesla's history where it was um, a little bit of a scarier stock, right? You know, back back here, you know, what did they have? They, you know, Model S was maybe going to come out. It was a scary stock during this whole time period. But what I saw was Model 3 came out, right? Model 3 started ramping and... What what I kind of noticed was, oh my gosh, this is a business that is about to go through a huge revenue uptick, like massive, right? And this was a business in which was about to um, likely also switch to profitability from losses. If you understand how manufacturing businesses work in a business model like like Tesla, and if you really started to you know view how simple it is to put a Tesla together in terms of like how much smarter Tesla was going about it, how Tesla was essentially doing things like rather than having a million different components like a traditional car would make, right, or would have, Tesla would put everything basically uh, right on your screen. So a traditional car company would have a ton of different buttons, whereas Tesla would put it, you know, all on one screen like a Model 3, right? And so you end up saving a ton of cost over the long term when you do something like that and especially as you start to ramp the numbers and get them bigger right and so i just had a very different way of viewing tesla than i think uh, you know most of wall street did and a lot of folks did back then obviously after the stock when it started going on its huge runs a lot more folks jumped in the bandwagon a lot more folks started to understand this but back here it was a really really intriguing stock to 2018 2019 this was such an intriguing stock back here i don't think so really it was too early days in my opinion and up here it's not you know it's, it's you know it's not bad but it's not like it was right you know back back here it was um that was that was a magical time so let's just put it that way because not a lot of people really understood it they just didn't get it they just didn't understand what the business was about to do over the coming years and you know obviously you know afterward right the years later people start to go back in time like oh yeah i saw that coming it's like come on did you really but um you know this was what i saw in tesla was i thought i missed out on amazon right which was frustrating because i always loved amazon's business model but i got too caught up in the short-term valuation around amazon i was like i'm not gonna let this happen again and I didn't, and and obviously it paid off in a massive, massive way. Um, you know, you you look at you look at the pre-order numbers that were coming in from Model Three, right? And then living out here on the West Coast, here in Vegas, and also traveling to LA sometimes, traveling to Arizona. By 2018, 2019, I was seeing more and more Teslas on the road, which was giving me even a, a better feeling in the real world. Like, hey, these cars are actually getting produced; they're actually getting on the road, which sometimes I think is actually an important factor. You gotta actually like see it in, for your face sometimes as a human to like know it's actually real, right? Otherwise, we start like disbelieving, right? It's like if we can't see Santa Claus, then Santa Claus is soon real, right? And so. You know, this is something that's obviously uh, pretty darn important. You know, we go we go look at something like AAPL. And what you're finding in some of these companies is they just have relentless management teams. The type of management teams that they just constantly, 
improve their companies more and more and more and more, okay? You know, if we even pull up a five-year on, on Apple, right? Um, Apple's just a beast. You know, what can you say about Apple? All they've done is just stay relentless in their business model and the way they grow revenues, the way they grow profits over time. I mean, you can't really say anything bad about it. And the, the interesting thing about you know, about Apple prior to pretty much the last year was the stock st- traded so dang cheap. And if you remember a lot of my Apple bit videos many years ago, I would always make a case that Apple should be value similar to how um, you know Procter and Gamble's valued or Johnson and Johnson or something like that because it's such a consistent business model. And when they come out with a new iPhone, people go get the new iPhone. No different than if somebody needs a new roll of paper towels, they buy some some you know uh, the brands that Procter and Gamble owns or Kimberly Clark, right? And so. Or Coca-Cola, Pepsi, right? And so that's the way I always viewed the, the valuation should go. It finally happened where Apple's finally valued that way, but it should have been valued like that for years. And you know why? Because the numbers are already showing you that. The consistency, the you know, the customer sat numbers, these were all showing, you know, uh, that this business model is just going to keep growing and growing and growing. And obviously... It's done nothing but grow. And you, I mean, you if you go back to, you know, when the iPhone came out, that was, let's see. So iPod's out right around here, roughly. That's like 20-something cents on a split-adjusted basis. Oh, my gosh. Man. Whew, crazy. Um, let's see where it was at in 2007. I don't think we're getting the full chart here. There we go. we got to pull it up. There we go. All right, so 2007. It's like a four or five dollar stock in two thousand seven, and look at this great recession hits. This is when iPhones already out at that time, three bucks on a split adjusted basis for Apple. Mm, man, imagine paying three dollars for, imagine paying three dollars for Apple stock. You know what I mean? Like that's just crazy. And um, you know, by this time, Apple was already a very very healthy company. That's you know, this wasn't. If you were investing in Apple in, in uh, what would that be, 2000, uh, in 99, 98, man, you were taking a big risk, right? I mean, at that time, there was, there was a, you know, real fear that Apple was going to go bankrupt, right? I mean, you were taking a huge risk, and, and, you know, shout out to anybody who did, and I doubt anybody's watching this video that actually bought that stock back then, but, you know, let me see if we can oh, go back here a little bit. Oh, no, that's not what I wanted to do. I don't know. Maybe I can go back a little bit more here. 98. 25 cents in 98. 25 cents on a split adjusted basis for Apple in 1998. Wow. Imagine paying 25 cents for Apple. <laughs> oh, gosh. Uh, 33 cents. 98. 99. 36 cents. Jeez. My gosh. What's interesting about Apple is... You know, all stocks in the tech sector were pretty much crashing in 2000, right? Meanwhile, Apple stock was pretty much going up throughout 99 and 2000 while all other tech stocks were crashing. Why is that? Because then they weren't going to go bankrupt and then they were starting to build their business uh, back, right? Well, I mean, you could no, actually looking at it. Uh, 2001, 37 cents. Yeah, I mean, Apple got hit as well. 33 cents. So you could have got, let's see, 36 cents, 2001. Check this out, guys. 2002, Apple shares were 25 cents. That seems insane on a split-adjusted basis. I mean, you're talking, I believe iPod was already out at that time or was already coming out, right? That's incredible. I mean, 25 cents? You're going to be flipping my, flipping my flapjacks. Apple's $155 a share today, right? And... um. I mean, if you looked at what Steve Jobs was doing at that time, it was pretty apparent, I think, that I don't think it was apparent that Apple was going to become a multi-trillion dollar company at that time. But I think it was pretty apparent that Steve Jobs was not going to have this company go bankrupt by 2002. Not only that, I mean, that was pretty evident by about 2000, but they had this huge growth trajectory for likely years to go in front of themselves. This is prior to iPhone, right? And then even even in the iPhone days, like we chatted about there, right? I'm eating a Hershey bar, by the way. 
It's late at night. I like to eat a Hershey bar once in a while. 2005, dollar and 60 cents. Dollar and 33 cents, 2005. Let's see. iPhone's already ramping in 2009. And you get that stock for four dollars and thirty cents. You know, that's just incredible when you look at it, something like that. And not like you know, it wasn't the hardest company to understand in the world. I can tell you that. What about when iPad was out as well? iPad came out. What was that? Two thousand ten? Maybe two thousand nine? Two thousand ten? I think. I think. The stock was what eight ten dollars. You know, this is, I mean, this is when the company had iPhone and iPad already in the market. Think about that for a moment. You would pick up Apple stock for $10 a share when they already had the iPhone in the market and it was already clear that was going to be a huge success, right? By, you know, 2010, that was clear, especially by the end of the year. And then they had iPad in the market, which got a ton of attention. That was actually my first, actually, that was my... What's my first Apple product I personally bought was the iPad 2, if I recall. The um, first I, uh, Apple product I started using was actually an iPod Touch that my wife won, who was my girlfriend at that time. From Quick Trip, she won it, um, I don't know, for what, but something at Quick Trip. And, and I started using the iPod Touch all the time, and I loved that thing. It was amazing. It's absolutely amazing, right? But, um, yeah... I mean, it's, it's 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 incredible, right? When you look back at some of these stocks and and some of the runs they had, when you know we're talking about time periods where it wasn't like it was something crazy. It's not like these were some penny stocks that no one knew about and was like, "Whoa, this was such a secretive stock." That's the thing, you know what I mean? Like, automatically, if you think about like I'm going to make a fortune in stocks, you you think like it has to be some under the radar penny stock or something like that, which it does. It just doesn't. You know what I mean? Like you and 10 extra money, 15 extra money, 20 extra money, a lot more than that. And some, some companies that are just amazing companies that have these massive growth trajectories in front of them. And a lot of folks just, you know, they don't quite get that. And um, that, that's kind of, you know, frustrating sometimes. I mean, look at something like Google, right? I mean, this is this is a company once again not like some under the radar stock that no one knows about, and you look at Google McDougal. I mean, let's let's go back in time a little bit. Two thousand six, you can pick these shares up for one hundred ninety eight bucks, right? Let's see, two thousand nine. I mean, two thousand nine is two twenty nine. So I mean, if you were buying this stock in two thousand nine, you you've ten x your money. You have over ten x your money, right? Uh, 2010, 242. So even if you were buying the stock in, in 2010, you've over 10 extra money. You know, once again, Android, right? Android was obviously going to be huge in the market. Google search was already a massive giant, right? Like that was clear and that was clear that it was going to not go away anytime soon, right? And just get more and more profitable. YouTube, they already owned YouTube for a long time by this point. And um, it was clear more and more folks were using YouTube, being interested in YouTube as a, as a product, right? And so when you look at it from kind of that context, it's like, my gosh, man, it's another one of those stocks that it's not rocket science, man. It's like, it's Google McDougal. Like it was clear they were going to continue to grow their business bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's not even viewing all their other businesses. Just from Google search perspective, YouTube perspective, and Android perspective, those three things alone give you like, you know, all the justification in the world. And, you know, this is a stock that just, you know, has 10 X people's money over the past, you know, 10 something years. And, um, not, not, not like, oh, like if you buy in Google stock, like what risk were you really taking? Were you really taking any type of serious risk, right? Let's look at Netflix, you know, Netflix, geez, you know, what a beast this one's been. If you look at this company, this is back really when it was, you know, the, the, the days when they would send you an actual DVD to your house. A lot of you guys probably watching this video that are younger. You probably have no clue what I'm talking about right now. Uh, but anyways, that was what Netflix used to be. You used to like send it in. The, they used to send it to you in the mail. You used to send it back. It was the whole thing. But anyways, you know, this stock went through a massive dip here from 42 all the way down to 9 bucks. Massive dip. And this was kind of when... The company was shifting from a DVD model to essentially streaming. 
And there was a lot of confusion around were they going to be successful in this market? Was the company going to be, you know, make it make it to the other side and things like that? And uh, yeah, I mean, 10 years ago, Netflix was $9 a share. $9 a share, guys. The sad part is I was investing in the market at that time and I understood Netflix. I didn't buy any dang shares. Ugh, frustrating. But as this company grew bigger and bigger and bigger, obviously, it began to become more of a, I guess you can say, sure thing, right? I will say back then, it definitely would have been um, scary to invest in. And back then, I didn't really understand growth stocks well enough, which obviously I didn't. I didn't buy Amazon, even though I love the, that business model. That was the one that really frustrates me. Um, but, you know, this one, 9 bucks a share back then, 10 bucks a share, $15 a share. Man, and as the company grew bigger and bigger and they got more and more clients, you, you still look at this stock, $99 a share just back five years ago, um, you know, 600 plus here today, that's a, what, a 6X? 6X in a matter of five years, pretty darn good, right? For, once again, this isn't some under the radar company that like no one's heard of and they're like, oh my gosh, like, what is this company? I never heard of this one, um, you know, uh, a company that I was fortunate to participate in for some huge runs was Monster Energy. And, um, you know, this is just a stock that went on some crazy runs. I mean, back in 2004, on a split adjusted basis, the shares are 57 cents. It's $96 today, you know, like crazy. But even when I was buying the stock 2010, 2011, it was pretty clear that Monster was going to get bigger and bigger. They were getting into more and more categories. This wasn't like some super confusing stock that like you couldn't ever understand or something like that and i mean you look at this stock is 10 bucks and two on a split adjusted basis 2011 it's almost 100 now it's basically a 10x 10x in about 10 11 years uh for a drink company this isn't a tech company this isn't anything this is literally just selling energy drinks <laughs> like you know what i mean like and, and just getting into more SKUs, into stores getting more different products on shelves and things like that right building the brand bigger and bigger over time. And you look at the stock and it's it's gone from, you know, on a split adjusted basis back in 2010 at $7 to 96 here today. And uh, all they've done is just execute and build the brand stronger and get more SKUs, build the, board, the brand more strong, get more SKUs. And that's all literally all the company's done uh, for the past, you know, 15, 20 years. And they've built them, you know, uh, what is this? Probably a forty billion dollar mark cap now. Oh, sorry. Jeez, I, it's been a while since I kept up with Monster. It's fifty one billion dollars now. Built a fifty one billion dollar company out of energy drinks. You know, wow. That's all I'll say about that. And I mean, energy drinks is a, a very competitive category. Um, I, I will say that. But man, they've done a heck of a job competing. They've done a heck of a job competing. Look at Ulta, Ulta Beauty here, back in two thousand ten. $31 stock, here today, 370 So it's, this stock's over 10 x over the past decade or so. Uh, 2011, $37, and today's $370. So yeah, this, this company's 10 x and this is another one, you know, not super complicated, like they, they have cosmetic stores, right? But over the years, they've always gotten into more and more verticals outside of just being a, a makeup place and, and more just along beauty in general. And then having services where you can get your hair done or your nails done, things like that. Uh, maybe even facials. And all these things over the years they've launched have, have made the, the, the stores more and more attractive to be in, right? Now Ulta's working big partnerships with even stores like Target to get in those stores. And um, I mean, gosh, you know, not not a super hard one to wrap your head around. Like it's a dang retail store, a retail store, right? But their their clientele is amazing. Their business is amazing. They continue to build it bigger. And um, if you've gotten this stock over the past ten years, you've ten extra money, and uh, done very darn well for yourself, right? And once again, this isn't a, a super hard company to understand, right? Uh, I'm gonna pause this video real quick. I want to take you guys through some other things. So now that we just went through a ton of stocks, I thought we'd play around on a compounding calculator for a bit. This could be fun. Um, and, and so I think what you, we should have learned on that last part there is, you know, you don't need to be in, in necessarily uh, rocket science stocks to 
you know, be, be, be a very, very successful investor and to build up to some crazy amounts of money, right? You got to identify the opportunities. You got to identify the management teams that are, that are relentless, that they just keep expanding that business. They aren't slowing down. They're not stopping. They want to keep expanding it. And the companies that are building their brand stronger and stronger and stronger over time, right? And, um, those sorts of business models that are sticky are the most magical ones of, of the bunch, right? So now let's play around on a little compounding calculator for a bit here. Uh, I think this is always really important. So let's say you start out with a thousand bucks and let's say you put a thousand a month. I think that's pretty realistic for a lot of folks out there. You know, if you can't put at least a thousand a month, you got to ask yourself, do you have an income problem or an expense problem? Because this is roughly $250 a week. Um, especially in time periods like now where there's plentiful jobs out there. And I mean, I went by a fast food joint the other day. That's it was, what were they starting at? $17 an hour, some crazy amount. I'm like fast food, you know, geez, like my gosh, it's, it's insane. You know? So, you know, right now I, I think it's, it's very important that if, if you're not in a position to put at least a thousand dollars a month, you need to really like, you know, kind of look at your situation and be like, can you get a better job? Can you do something? Right. Um, so let's say, let's just say 10 years, you invest for 1,000, 1,000, 10 years. Um, let's say you get a 12% return, which is not great. And, you know, you're doing all right for yourself. In 10 years, you'd have $213,000. In 10 years, it's not like this is like, <laughs> you know, oh, when I'm 85 years old, I'm going to have some some amount. This is 10 years from now, right? You got, you're approaching nearly a quarter mil. That's with a, that, that's... It's the thing about this. This is not a crazy amount of money to put in your account. A thousand dollars a month is not a crazy amount, especially if you live in the United States of America. Um, you know, like I said, if you can't get that number, you gotta look at yourself and say, is it an expense problem or an income problem? And if it's an income problem, man, let's go. Let's go. Dang, uh, you know, let's, let's go get a better job. Let's go. You know, figure something out. Especially nowadays, man. It's not like we're in a time period where. Uh, the job market is super tough and it's like, oh man, it's so hard to get a good job. No, you know, back when, back when I was first entering the workforce in 2008, 2009, yeah, we could talk about a tough job market back then. Good luck getting, good luck getting a job. Never mind a good, a well-paying job. Right now, woo, we're in the furthest thing from that sort of jobs market at the moment, right? So not a crazy amount, but, but let's say you're, you're doing pretty well for yourself and let's say you can put $2,000 uh, a month toward this, right? Let's see what you're at in 10 years from now. Look at that. $424,000 now, right? Uh, you know, and once again, this is in 10 years. So it's not like a situation where it's like, when I'm 90 years old, I'm going to have, because I know sometimes, you know, when you play around a compounding calculator, it's fun to, to work it like way, way down the road, but then you work it way, way down the road and you're like, oh shoot, I would be like an old person by then. Or like, I'd be like, you know, 85 years old. I, you know, I understand that. Um, so, so this is really important, but let's say you can amp up the return. Let's say you can double up the market and get a really good return. I would call 16% a really good return. You're not great, but if you can get a 16% return, you're, you're very good. I would call you that. Okay. Now we're talking about $516,000, right? Well over half a million dollars, right? But Let's say you're you're really making some good money. Let's say you're making 100k plus a year. If you're making 100k plus a year, I think $3,500 is the the amount you should have, uh, basically to put in your stock market account. If you're making over 100,000 a year, right? I think you should have 3,500 a month to to contribute. Now we're talking about you have $900,000 in 10 years from now, right? So the amounts start getting really, really big. You're a very good investor. You're, you know, about 3,500. Now let's say we, we take it out a little bit. So let's say you're 30 and you're watching this and you're like, what could I have when I'm 50 if I can meet these type of numbers, right? $4.8 million. Uh, <laughs> you know, the, the amounts start to get really, really crazy. And so that's why, especially for anybody that's younger watching this video, I mean, this is why compounding is is named one of the the biggest wonders of the world because w when you tack on time and certain percentage returns it can be really really great right let's say all you did was the s&p 500 which would be you know i that's a failure in my opinion but whatever so we'll say eight percent per year now you're at 1.9 mil let's see how, see how big the difference is this is why you know some folks wonder like why put in the work 
towards stock market investing, why do the research work and whatnot? It's because when you when you do it and you, you run these numbers up, you're like, oh man. Because I mean, imagine when, you know, imagine not just the lifestyle you can live, but like what you can do for those around you. Um, what you can do after your life, you know, if you want to give away to charity or, or you know, foundations or whatever, right? It's, it's, it's not like it's small amounts of money. Just by basically changing your, your, you know, you're doubling up your return to 16%, you know, that's it. I mean, we're talking about a $3 million difference in a matter of 20 years, right? Now, let's take it one step further. Let's say you're 25 and you're watching this and you're wondering, well, what would I have when I'm 55? So let's say you're doing that you know, 30, let's see, <laughs> $22 million, $22 million, okay, pretty, pretty darn crazy, you know, amounts there, um, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna say which individual can do this, but I'm just gonna run an individual on, on what they can roughly do, once again, I'm not saying this, say this person 31 years old, so it's, say what they would have at 61 this hypothetical individual um that i i don't know who they are let's see how much they should have they should have 6.1 billion and that's if they just continue the 22 30 uh, 6.1 billion we'll leave it off there hope you guys enjoyed this this has just been a uh, little bit of a different video i thought it would just be fun to I mean, this is just late. This is stuff I do it late at night. So I hope you guys actually enjoy something like this. You know, if you do, smash the thumbs up if you've been here this whole time. It's just a little something different. So I was thinking about not even putting this out. But I mean, it's just like if I'm going to look at this stuff anyways, like why not just share it? So anyways, much love as always, guys. And have a great day. Peace.